Thank you. Welcome to the Transport for New South Wales Last Mile Freight Innovation Challenge launch. Uh, I'm Richard Tubb from the Open Data and Innovation Team at Transport for New South Wales. And firstly, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the country on which we meet together today, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. For those of you who weren't able to make it to our Last Mile Freight Innovation Forum back in March, today we'll be giving a recap of some of the content that we shared on that day. We'll also have representatives from our Transport Digital Accelerator and subject matter experts from Transport for New South Wales to present for you today. Plus you'll be given the opportunity to ask them any curly questions that you have saved up later in the Q&A session. We'll also be taking you through the innovation challenge process uh, and also uh, giving you, offering you uh, potential ideas uh, to help you on your way to submitting an application. Today's event uh, will be live streamed, so hello to everyone uh, watching at home today uh, or uh, watching on the side of your office when, desk when you should be doing other things, but uh, thanks very much for joining us, we do appreciate it. And also it will be recorded today, so uh, for those people who won't be able to join us live today. Uh, just a few items of housekeeping, uh, in the off chance that we have to evacuate uh, this wonderful room, then the emergency exit is just behind me here, out the doorway there, and if you haven't uh, found it uh, yet, the toilets are just over to the rear, uh, just near the, uh, the escalators there. And of course, if you haven't already done so, please follow us uh, on Twitter at datatfnsw, and feel free to tweet away. Today we'll be using the hashtag LastMileFreight. Uh, and of course we have lots of uh, information up there as well if you haven't uh, visited uh, the site. And if you'd like to follow along with the presentation today, uh, a download link to the presentation is available on the YouTube page if you're, uh, you're viewing it uh, via streaming. And also links to today's presentation and live stream uh, have been tweeted uh, earlier on today so you can find them there as well. If you do have any uh, curly questions that you don't get to ask here today, then feel free to email us at freightchallenge at transport.nsw.gov.au and uh, we'll be able to answer them for you directly. Kicking off the launch of the Last Mile Freight Innovation Challenge today will be Chris Bennett, Executive Director, Digital Products Delivery for the Customer Strategy and Technology Division at Transport for New South Wales. Please make welcome, Chris Bennett. Thanks for that. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate uh, the turnout and to everyone uh, on the live stream, thank you for joining us as well. I thought just in opening this, I'd just spend a couple of moments framing up, other than last mile freight, why we're actually here. Uh, back in 2016, we did a large crowdsourced strategy and roadmap uh, called the Future Transport Technology uh, Strategy and Roadmap. We brought together six, seven hundred industry leaders across transport and technology, uh, both in Australia and globally, and we asked them if you were basically, if you were the Secretary of Transport, so in government speak, the Secretary is like a group chief executive, what would you do to put technology at the centre of the decisions that we make around our transport infrastructure and operations and planning? And they came back with lots of different ideas. We over two days we we did a big design thinking session, got thousands of ideas out, and then we asked our employees, and then we asked the university students of New South Wales the same question over basically a, a year long effort. That roadmap is available for you to download, uh, and I would encourage you all to go and have a look at it because in it we talk about a few key concepts that you see as part of the everyday conversation that you'll experience with this team now. The first one is we uh, were encouraged to say and to, and to understand <coughs> that um, when we talk about future transport technology, there isn't one particular future we should be shooting for. The world isn't all going to autonomous vehicles, the world isn't all just going to mobility as a service. But rather, it's going to incrementally grow and change in, in, at different paces uh, and increments through the next 10, 15, 20 years. So what we need to do is to really get ourselves right with the, we're encouraged to think about platform enablers. So things and, and no regrets initiatives. So things that we should do no matter which way the future should go. Uh, bets like creating the digital accelerator 
which basically brings together the startup community industry. Uh, our partners in a design thinking environment up on level 11. We set them up here so that we can be part of the startup ecosystem of New South Wales and to get everyone to begin to think about transport technology, not just fintech. Our open data play, which is where a lot of the team that you, that you would have met and will meet over the next period uh, come from. We opened up all of our real-time data, so the real-time movements of every public transport vehicle across the network, uh, how full our trains are, how full our buses are, all in real time. Uh, and we made that available, and you can see that uh, in all the apps that you use today, uh, and even Google uh, shows you how full a bus is in real time at the moment. And what that kind of showed us, and we've had it, you know, I think we've had it open now for two and a half, maybe three years. We've just clicked over three billion API hits, uh, and, and with a community of over 15,000 developers. And what that says to us is that this idea of openness, this idea of working with you to help you activate uh, new business models on top of transport problems that we have, works. Last year we ran the Mobility as a Service Innovation Challenge uh, and we had a number of really good submissions from industry around that and we've talked uh, publicly about some of the winners that came from that and this year you'll see a number of those trials coming to effect. Last mile freight was one of the things identified in uh, the Future Transport Technology Roadmap and so for us it's critical to get last mile right and we believe that it's not something that we mandate and do, but rather it's something that we work and partner with you and the rest of the industry on to help get the most seamless, uh, uh, smooth environment working here in the city in New South Wales. So we're very keen to work with you all, very keen to learn as much as possible, and we've got this kind of uh, process that we call an innovation challenge that we'll take you through, uh, and we're keen to get your feedback and your contribution. So with that, Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chris. It's, uh, it's always great to have Chris here today, uh, and uh, also to see what uh, innovative products and uh, that will eventually hopefully come out of uh, this, and looking forward to seeing uh, a lot of uh, really impressive submissions. Our very next speaker is Mel Liu, who's a service designer at the Future Transport Digital Accelerator, where she uses human-centered design to solve complex problems. Prior to joining uh, the Accelerator, Mel played a pivotal role in trialing a number of innovative transport technologies, including automated shuttles and cars. And Mel will be taking us through the Accelerator's last mile freight showcase. Everyone, uh, please welcome Mel Liu. and I'm a service designer at the Accelerator, as Richard introduced me. Um, so I'll be talking through the project that we did last year um, where we looked at research around last mile freight in the Sydney, Sydney CBD. Um, so what I'll be going through today is um, our research findings, how it led to the innovation challenge, our four uh, problem spaces that we want to look at, and some concept thought starters to help you understand what we might be looking for. So first off, I'll talk a little bit about what the Accelerator is itself. Um, so we were set up to facilitate direct collaboration to between public and private sectors. So how we do that is we, um, for the Last Mile Freight Challenge, um, we spent eight weeks doing an intensive research project where we worked closely with the business and subject matter experts. So we worked very closely with um, Michael Stocko's team, um, who you'll hear from soon. Um, and we also speak to a whole bunch of um, industry and freight delivery operators. Um, and then post that, we um, also have a lot of industry partners that we partner up with, and we also want to tap into the startup, um, researcher, and entrepreneur space, and the Innovation Challenge is one of those ways that we do that. So I won't go into um, a lot of detail here, but this is basically um, our framework. So if you're familiar at all with human-centered design or design thinking, um, that's a methodology we use. So um, for the purposes of the Last Mile Freight um, Research Project, we spent a lot of time in the understand phase, really trying to understand if um, what was the actual problem, what was the underlying cause of um, last mile freight congestion in the CBD, um, what were some behaviours that were exacerbating that, 
Um, and we also spent a bit of time looking at potential solutions, which I'll be going through today. Um, when you guys submit your um, own individual solutions, you don't have to um, think about the solutions that we've, um, we came up with. They were just useful to help frame our thinking and to give you an indication of what we might be looking for. So, why is um, freight congestion within the CBD a problem? So, CBD roads are already um, stretching at their seams and population is set to increase to 2.1 million um, within the next 20 years. And as part of this, city trips um, are set to increase by 25% by um, 2031, which is uh, pretty crazy when you think about how crowded our roads are already. And um, consumers and businesses are um, more and more um, demanding convenience and immediacy. Um, so increasingly, consumers are um, wanting um, same-day deliveries, they're wanting um, convenience in terms of where people are actually, um, where freight delivery drivers are actually giving their parcels. Um, so that's why there's actually been an increase in the number of um, uh, parcels being delivered in the city because more and more people are wanting to get um, parcels delivered to their office, for example. Um, and this is all adding up to a big congestion problem in CBD. So um, that led us to our problem statement, um, our problem space. So how might we reduce the number of freight trips coming into the city so that we decrease, decrease congestion and drive improved economic activity? So I'm going to take you through some of our research um, that we did and how it led to our four public spaces. So we spoke to a lot of subject matter experts. So as I said previously, um, we did work extensively with um, subject matter experts within Transport for New South Wales. Uh, we also engaged City of Sydney and Sydney Business Chamber as part of this project. And we also spoke to um, transport management and transport engineering experts at University of Melbourne and University of Sydney. Uh, we also spoke to a lot of customers, so these are the people who are dispatching um, a lot of freight deliveries um, or who are receiving a lot of freight deliveries. Um, so for example, we spoke to um, people who operate mainly in food, so grounds, coals. Um, we spoke to retail operators, um, Shopo, Optus. So we spoke to a whole range of different um, customers to really understand what their business models were, um, what drove their decision making in terms of, um, I guess, ordering deliveries. Uh, we also spoke to eight delivery drivers who actually have to go out and make those deliveries and two service technicians. And um, last but not least, we also spoke to industry to really understand, um, I guess, their business models and what was driving their behaviour. So we spoke to um, actual freight companies like Australia Post um, and Toll and DHL. <coughs> we also spoke to some other, um, I guess, companies who are adjacent. And we also made site visits to um, observe operations. So we visited a couple of um, uh, freight operating centers to understand how freight was being um, allocated and delivered. Um, and we also had service designers who sat in with delivery drivers as they were doing their rounds within the CBD um, to understand their behaviors as well. So from our research, we found that um, the types of vehicles that were coming into the C Sydney CBD per day 12% of these were light commercial vehicles, um, so that includes white vans. And 3% uh, of these were heavy commercial vehicles. So for the most part of our research, we decided to focus on light commercial vehicles um, because of the sheer number of them, and also we felt like we could make a big difference in this aspect. So um, we realized that there were two different ways in which we could actually reduce congestion in CBD. Um, so that was reducing the number of kilometers driven by delivery drivers as they're trying to um, make their rounds, and also reducing the number of trips actually going into the Sydney CBD. So also from our research, we identified um, a couple of different key um, customer personas. So um, no delivery drivers were one and none of the others. Um, these were, I guess, an amalgamation of um, a lot of our research. And we wanted to um, bring some of those key behaviors to life. So that's why we developed these customer personas. So I'm going to start off um, with the two in red um, up the top. So the anywhere parker. So um, this um, behavior was really exhibited when drivers had um, deliveries that were time critical. Um, so, for, for example, food goods that had to be delivered within a certain time frame um, or else the goods would expire or else um, the restaurant wasn't going to get um, their food to be able to make their food. Um, so the Anywhere Parker would um, try in vain to find a parking spot and they would give up and end up um, parking on the side of the street and putting on their hazard lights. 
Um, and then we also have the overstayer. So the overstayer um, was the delivery drivers who tended to take a bit more risk. Um, so they were willing to um, risk having that parking fine if they, um, if it meant they could stay in that um, parking spot for a little bit longer, so they could make a couple more deliveries. Um, we've also got um, the other players um, happening, not just the delivery drivers. We've got the operator and the receiver. So the operators um, tended to try and encourage um, as much positive behaviour as possible. Um, but in terms of the receiver, whether that be a consumer or a business, um, they're really focused on trying to maximise their personal utility. Um, so for them, it doesn't really matter how it gets delivered to them, as long as it gets delivered to them um, within a certain time frame or within the service level agreement. They don't really care how it happens. Um, and then we'll go to the um, bottom left. So we've got the traditional driver. So um, this tended to be drivers who um, had driven for 30 plus years um, and when um, congestion in the Sydney CBD wasn't so bad um, and they were still driving with that mindset. So um, a lot of time these drivers would, um, for example, if they had a um, delivery they had to do on Clarence Street, they would try and find a parking spot on Clarence Street, do the delivery, and if they had a um, delivery on Margaret Street, they would drive over to Margaret Street and try and find a parking spot there, for example. Um, so they weren't really thinking about, well, how about I try and do a hub model, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and park in a particular spot and try and do the deliveries from there. Um, and the optimistic circular um, was the uh, driver with the positive frame of mind who would try and find the closest car spot possible. They would end up driving round and round in circles trying to find um, the best parking spot possible because sometimes this wasn't um, available. And then we've got um, the top left, we've got the green. So the team worker. So the team worker um, were drivers who would try and look at all the different options that they had and try to, um, I guess, take advantage of them. So um, they were the ones who would try and interface with um, cyclist um, delivery drivers or um, with walking delivery, delivery walkers, I guess. Um, and they would um, also utilize things like um, a locker freight hub where they would um, put a whole bunch of goods there and then, um, for example, cyclists would come and collect those goods and do the last mile um, delivery. And then we've got the last um, customer persona, which was the hubber. So the hubber um, would tend to try and find um, a parking spot and service a whole precinct and do a lot of walking in between those um, like last mile um, journeys. So for example, if um, a driver had 20 jobs in Vineyard and 20 jobs in Central, um, they would try and find one parking spot in Vineyard, service the whole precinct, then move down to Central and service that whole precinct. So um, a lot of these customer personas um, helped us to come up with our profit statements along with all of our other research. So I'll quickly go through um, our four problem spaces. So we've got how might we create awareness of the bigger transport picture? How might we maximise positive behaviours? How might we make deliveries more efficient? And how might we encourage greater end-to-end -end collaboration? So these are the four problem spaces that um, we thought we could probably make the most, that um, whatever solution we come up with might be able to make the most impact in terms of um, uh, short-term viability and tacticalness. Um, so when you're um, being, when you go into the website to submit your um, submission, um, we'll have a section that says which one of your ideas um, aligns to these problem spaces. Um, and also there's an option of other if it doesn't align with any of these, but these are um, some of the problem spaces that we've really looked at. So, creating awareness of the bigger transport picture. So, what does that really mean in a bit more detail? Um, so, a more, um, I guess, refined problem sta uh, statement. Um, is how might we build a system that allows the government to monitor how freight is delivered in the CBD so that we have a deeper understanding of how to improve freight movements going forward for government and delivery operators. So an example of how this might come to life, um, like I said earlier, these are concept thought starters. So um, we're not necessarily wanting you to come up with um, these ideas. Um, if you come up with something completely different, that's great. Um, these are just used to, I guess, stimulate your thinking. So the idea that we came up with for um, this particular problem statement was smart loading zones. So this is a system that supports the correct use of loading zones um, and provides a view of how freight is delivered in the city. So how this idea might work is that um, a driver would register their vehicle online and they would get access to the system. They would get supplied with an ID and for example, an RFID sticker, doesn't really matter what technology it is. 
the driver would tap on to activate um, their set amount of free loading zone time, um, and parking sensors would also record the time spent. And then the driver would proceed to deliver the parcels, and um, once they're done, they can just tap off and that's exit. So the outcomes of this um, is that it really builds an evidence base of freight data, so it enables um, transport for New South Wales and um, urban planners in general to know um, how much our loading zones are being utilised, um, whether it be that um, the loading zones are constantly um, being utilised or that certain areas are being underutilised, it'll give us a really good database. Um, it'll hopefully improve parking compliance um, for those uh, drivers who um, are overstaying. Um, we'll, it will hopefully also um, change some of those bad driver behaviours um, and it will build a case for new changes um, if we understand where people are tending to park. So maximising positive behaviours. So what's the opportunity for the delivery drivers? So how about we trial delivery spaces that operate in line with the needs of delivery operators and delivery drivers of light commercial vehicles so that we continue to create positive behaviours that foster improved and efficient freight deliveries. So the concept thought starter we um, came up with for this one was um, dedicated delivery spaces. So allocating our um, parking spaces for delivery drivers to um, encourage those positive behaviours. So um, for example, a delivery driver could um, see that there's an empty bookable space, um, they could book it. Um, once they get there, they could um, park for a longer period of time um, and they could really set up a street side delivery van hub similar to the hubber model that we saw um, in the customer personas. Um, and that means that van drivers can deliver more, um, they don't risk getting a parking fine, and they also reduce the number of kilometres in the city because they're anchored in that one spot. They could also work with, um, for example, a locker freight hub. Um, to create handover spots so that deliveries can be reallocated to cyclists, for example, um, and deliveries can be matched to the most suitable transport method. Um, and you could also have a system where you have van um, package top-ups, um, so you encourage these behaviours to continue. So if we were to um, run this trial, for example, um, it could reduce the number of kilometres driven once again by um, delivery drivers because they can stay in that one spot. Um, the trial would be able to build some evidence and data um, and really build a case as to whether or not this is actually making a difference to the congestion levels in the CBD or not. Making deliveries more efficient. So, um, this was for delivery operators and drivers. So, how might we improve the visibility of delivery space usage so that we make it easier for drivers to obtain the ideal path for their needs? So, the concept thought starter for this one was um, loading zone availability data um, being made accessible via a map. So um, a driver could log on to the app um, before they make their next delivery run. They check the app um, and it shows them where um, the loading zones or the parking spaces are being used or unused. A vacant spot could be located and then the app could um, potentially direct the delivery driver to that spot by GPS mapping um, and then they could park there. So once again, reducing the number of kilometres driven by delivery drivers because they know exactly where they're heading towards, they know there's a spot available there. Um, it's an improved situation for delivery drivers. And also, once again, paints a picture of whether the system is working or not. Um, so for example, if all of the spots are constantly being occupied, um, it could signal to us that we need to create more zones, for example, let's just say. Um, so it really provides that evidence base and that data. Greater end-to-end -end collaboration. So this was really targeted at all participants in the delivery journey, um, not just the drivers and the operators, but also the consumers themselves. <coughs> so how about we help retailers, drivers, and receivers to start exhibiting more collaborative methods of delivery so that we make the inbound and outbound freight trips cause less CBD congestion. So the thought starter for this one was um, an, open, an open digital platform, um, which is linked to a network of delivery hubs or banks um, which could be multi-purpose drop-off and pick-up points. So um, we've got an example here. So let's just take the um, Locker Freight Hub once again as an example. So drivers um, could drop off um, packages here for cyclists or walkers to take, and they could also even pick up um, goods that retail operators are dropping off at this place. 
Um, in terms of the consumer side, you've got um, retail operators who can drop off what they need to deliver and also pick up what they need. Um, and for everyday consumers as well, that could also be a thing where um, they go to the locker and they pick up their goods, um, which is similar to a model that's being used in Japan right now. So the outcomes of this, um, it's a positive change in all behaviors. Um, it's reducing the number of kilometers driven once again, um, and everyone in the journey is playing their part. And that's it for me. Very good. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, lots of terrific content there uh, for everyone. I hope that uh, you've absorbed some of that. And if not, obviously, you can download uh, the, uh, the presentation packet and go through it uh, uh, in your own time. Also, welcome back to everyone on the live stream. Unfortunately, we've had to have uh, a, uh, a URL change of the live stream. So welcome back for those people joining us. And, and if we've lost anyone, then uh, yes, hopefully uh, you'll be back uh, soon. So thank you very much for coming back online. Oh uh, yes, uh, Mel, if Mel, if you could step up and just do that on again, that'd be pretty good. That's okay. Well, uh, they can download it later. Our very next speaker is Mike Stoker, Associate Director of Freight and Servicing, Sydney Coordination Office at Transport for New South Wales. The Sydney Coordination Office is focused on managing the transport act activities within the Sydney CBD and other major locations across the metropolitan area while major infrastructure projects are underway. Mike's role is focused on the efficiency of current CBD freight and servicing activity and the future strategies that will serve the city for decades to come. No small task indeed there, Mike. So please welcome everyone, Mike Stoker. Thank you very much. Well, I'm looking slightly casual today because, uh, as uh, just been mentioned, we've um, just been out looking at a slightly different problem and uh, just been out in Parramatta and any of, any of you who uh, go to Parramatta, just the amount of construction going on there, you know, there's thousands and literally thousands of construction workers coming into the, city, into the, the CPD there. And, um, it poses a challenge about where these guys are going to park on a daily basis, how they're actually, what their travel is in, in terms of coming to work. And um, yeah, it's uh, so just actually been looking at that. It's pretty interesting to actually you know, see these behaviors that these guys come in. So, um, Look, so I'm just going to talk a bit more about uh, my problem. If I tell you my problem, you can tell me the solution, basically, hopefully, in your submissions. So as we said, we've got a, this population that's going to increase, um, which obviously means this increase of uh, vehicles coming into the CBD, CBD by about 25% in, uh, in 2031. And, um, and our city of, Sydney, uh, city of Sydney are looking even further ahead about what that number is um, by 2050. And, um, it doesn't end, it just keeps increasing as uh, more cities uh, grow and grow. But if we actually think about this, uh, well, what is 25% increase in uh, people coming in, in what, uh, only 12 years time now, does that mean we're going to have 25% more freight? It would clearly be a win if we only had 20% more freight, but it is actually possible as well that we could have even more. We could have 30% freight, you know, we could have even something greater than that which obviously means you know, we're here, we're talking about actually how do we reduce, how do we manage it, um, and it could be a case of just running to stand still. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's just a relentless challenge basically as, uh, as a derived demand, freight's just gonna keep increasing as the population increases. Um, and it's a whole host of challenges that we've actually got uh, that, uh, that, we, that we're looking at. So there's the fact that the city is transforming. There's the, um, you know, we want a, a vibrant urban, urban environment. That means we want a, a successful commercial economy during the day. That means we want a vibrant nighttime economy. That's two different supply chains already that we're actually talking about. And then we're talking about sustainability challenges. We want to do it more efficiently. We want it, uh, we want it better for the environment as it comes in. We've got increased urban living going on. I'm not quite sure what the actual number is of uh, residents coming into the CBD, but there's just more and more towers, high density residential coming in, um, you know, which again, which is another supply chain coming in to actually service these. A lot of these places are not gonna have cars. So people are going to be saying, well, you know, going, they're going to be tapping onto e-commerce, getting onto the Deliveroo, getting onto Woolworths and Coles on the night and just generating more supply chain activity to actually 
supply their business, supply their homes. Um, there's the changing trends of uh, just e-commerce, you know, just uh, ordering stuff, getting it delivered sometimes to the CBD, sometimes delivered to home, but again, it's just generating more and more freight. Um, and then there's challenges <coughs> about land reclassification. You now, um, just having a discussion before uh, before we started here about some of these challenges, about getting people to build capacity within their new buildings that will accommodate the actual supply chain that that building above generates. Um, you could go even further to say, how do you actually build something that actually accommodates the, the supply chain activity around a, around a, an area? And we talked about Rurangaroo last time, and that does that well. Um, that's probably a bit of a unique case, but you know, there are challenges in the heart of the TBD that, um, physical challenges, that you know, how do we actually manage that to supply chain that's being generated? Um, and then simply look, we've got more jobs coming in, more, pro more um, and tran transport infrastructure projects happening. So, um, as, a, as you, uh, you know, you've no doubt realised in that, and we are quite proud of it from a transport perspective, we've got a long pipeline of transport infrastructure projects, and if they all come into the CBD, they're all going to have an impact. They're all going to be chewing up some curbside capacity to, to, to um, get them built. So. Um, look, our approach that we've actually been taking to solving the problem over the last four and a half years of doing this is to think what we've talked about as being four hours. Can we retime stuff to use the latent capacity of the network outside of the peaks, particularly overnight? Um, can we reroute stuff? Um, and that could be actually you know, sending it to an alternative destination, moving traffic away from the CBD that doesn't need to be here. Um, Mel was talking about some of the things with bikes, and you know we've been doing stuff in Golden Street car park about you know getting people to actually come in, use bikes to deliver around the heart of the CBD rather than actually sending a van in. Too many just deliver a small package. Um, and then we've got reduce. Well, you know we've, we've we've played around with a couple of areas of reduce, but we've we've brought that along to the innovation hub and said, well, can you help us? Uh, we want to actually really get something going about looking initiatives for reducing the actual amount of freight coming into the CBD. So, you know, typically, we've looked our approach in typical of many cities is just talking about those four R's as themes and potential solutions for reducing it. But you know, primarily, in this particular case, we're on about how do we reduce. Um, bit of a just an explanation. Um, look, you know, of the challenges we face. Um, and this is a, you know, just an, an explanation of, of an actual freight task. So we had a, a colleague yeah, gone back four years ago who said, well, don't understand why the, why the street's so full of all these vans. What are they all doing? So we went along the streets and we thought, well, what's the most basic commodity to man? Bread? Well, okay. So we went along one block of the city street and uh, we counted the 230 different types of bread for sale in one block of the city street. Now. That, apparently that's what consumers want. You know? So in order to actually get that, it's come from 35 different suppliers, it's 80 deliveries a day. So consumer choice, the things that make cities great, that means you can go out and you can have whatever you want to eat today, and you can have whatever you want to drink, and, and you know, have hundreds of different types of coffee paper, or bread, or drink, or kombucha, you know, whatever is available out there. But it comes at a cost. Now I could make the world really efficient if you know in my Mike's dystopian if you both been as Prime Minister and my dystopian party, we can have a really efficient freight task, one very pleasant, but you know, we can get rid of all this freight task and we can reduce freight, but it's not a very pleasant world out there. Um, so consumers want choice. But it means that we just have a big freight task in order to achieve that and that means that 25% increase in population could actually end up with a 30-35% increase in, t in terms of the supply chain. Bringing stuff in, more waste options, taking stuff out. So, the key problems then that we end up with is that, well, the city's already given freight as a high priority from a curbside perspective. Can anyone actually think of a bit of curbside space that's available during the day for general parking? There's a couple of five minute spots around and some space outside the doctors on Macquarie Street. But really, there's no other general parking that's available in the heart of the CBD. Every bit of curbside space that can be generated to the freight task has been given to the freight task 
Um, so there's kind of nothing left to give unless we're actually going to start restricting bus movements or passenger movements of traffic. So you know, so we've we've hit the peak. Anything from here is probably when we talk about a 25% increase in population and the growing trade task, it's probably likely to mean in 12 years' time we'll have even less curbside space than we have now. So supply's going like that, demand's going like that, so hence it's important to be thinking about, well, what's the solution going to be like for the future because it can't be like it is now. So we've got fair, fair, finite curbside space. We can't, we can't create any more streets. We can't create any more curbside space at least at the peak anyway, there are opportunities outside the peak, so the supply chain could move more and more into the overnight period. Um, we're working on several things around loading dock provision, and that trying to actually get better loading docks accommodated off the street and move that, but of course that's a longer term plan. Any building proposed today is only going to be sort of realized and available in five, six years time. Um, the now, freight is essentially non-discretionary. You know, it's it's going to come here. Um, you want orders. You, you know, you want things delivered. Your CEO wants things delivered. That's just going to come here to satisfy those particular demands. And the retailers out there, look, you know, they are actually giving service offerings. They'll no doubt in a few years' time they'll be service offerings of one-hour delivery, or you know, for you order today and we'll deliver in two or three hours to anywhere you want it in the CBD. So. Potentially, that's even more freight that's actually going to be coming at us. And now we've got a city of undergoing change. Yes, you know we're we're growing, we're accommodating all this. The consequence is we've got more construction traffic coming in, and we're actually taking away curbside space to provide work zones to accommodate that. So it's a bit it's a hell of a challenge, basically, in, in order to achieve this. Um, you know, you say, well, why do actually people use, use the street in terms of loading docks? And there's a whole bunch of reasons. It might be an older building. It might be people can't use a loading dock. The truck doesn't fit. Um, there's a few examples around like that where people just build a lower loading dock and the truck doesn't fit in. Um, the customer doesn't have access to it. The, build, the building manager has ac access to it and he has some weird rules. That basically means you can't get in so easy. Um, this is a common one. You've got a guys coming in who are doing courier deliveries. They're going to two different addresses. I don't want to go into here and then drive out and go into here, and that's just time consuming. It's far better if I can find a space on the street and I can run into both of these addresses from one parking spot and probably four or five more addresses as well within that local area. Um, you're getting into a dock, you've got to go around it, some one way system, and it's just you know far better if I just pull up on the adjacent street, run through a building, get a delivery done, and you know, I don't have to go into a one-way system. And we've got a couple of classic examples of that, you know, Pitt Street, if uh, there are any delivery drivers, anyone involved in deliveries out there has a, has a bit of a nightmare reputation. Um, you've got to create a booking, don't like doing admin, you know, you, your, uh, w your work schedule is pretty flexible, you don't quite know when you're going to get there, so that's potential problem and then just the hours may be restrictive or getting in you get into the dock it's congested um, you've got to go into a turntable wait your turn to actually get on there you know it just takes too long so there's a whole bunch of reasons we really why we end up with these scenarios on the street um, point is it's not sustainable you know we have to keep telling people when they're putting up new buildings there's no guarantees that that curbside space is going to be there so you know, as I said, supply is going like that, demand is going like that. What do we know about the curbside space? Well, we monitor it with the, with the help of the City of Sydney. We've got a, we know there's about 3 million button presses a year on the loading zones. Um, it's got a profile like that. It peaks between about 9, 11 and uh, midday. Um, and we know, if we, if we take it into account the operational capacity of that, it'd be about 75, 80%, we know at this time of day, the system is over capacity. So delivery drivers going out here are they're hurting each other, basically. They um they're you know, they're competing for space. They're causing delays to each other. There there's inefficiencies in the system at this time. But we're also seeing growth of actually people coming in at this point, at this time early in the morning as well. Or you see drivers on the street parking at this time of day. Who's got the who've got the whole street to themselves? So there's some issues, basically, you know, we, we do have some data, uh, which is kind of a proxy 
um, for the loading zone, the, for, the, for the activity in the city. So you know, we have access to this, and we know how many loading zones are there. But you know, typically, look, that's the problem that we're actually dealing with. It's just that capacity issue. Um, and we've you know, we've done some research, and we know what the actual trends are in terms of actually the dwell time of, vehicle, of drivers being out there. So. Yeah, passenger vehicles are allowed to pull into a loading zone, typically have a relatively low dwell time. The ranges are out there, anyone who actually parks, you know, these are the easy people to get tickets from a load, and kick them out of the loading zone. The delivery drivers are doing slightly more in terms of the deliveries that they're actually doing. Um, and then everyone likes to complain about the tradies and parked in loading zones, but you know, we've actually seen some greater, better uh, management and enforcement of that and their average dwell time on the city streets is reducing. So this is research we've done you know, over, over a period of time. So we've got an idea of what the actual behaviors are out there to match with our quantitative data. Um, and just, you know, and lastly on that, I know as we go forward into the future, we're gonna see less vehicles potentially going into park car parks, more requirement for vehicles pulling up on the streets, pick up and drop off, if you think about a, a world of automated vehicles. Um, they're going to drop you off and then they're going to head off somewhere else. We hope they're not going to go and do laps around the block. Or uh, the future prob probably means that we as transport are going to have to think about what our policies are for, for zero occupancy vehicles, not just the single occupancy vehicles of today, but what, how will we actually manage zero occupancy? What that means as well, though, is that there's only one type of actually curbside space in the city that's going to be given up to accommodate that task. Loading zones. So, just again, just the supply basically, as we look into the future, is just going to keep getting hit for this challenge. So, we've got to think about how we're actually going to manage it. Um, look, at last time I, you know, I talked about some of the solutions that, that are out there elsewhere in the world, about uh, you know, a, a depot in the heart of London, um, actually only 400 metres from Buckingham Palace. So, you know, there are solutions basically that can be implemented into the heart of the city in 500 square meters of space sort of actually doing deliveries um, using s small electric vehicles an entirely electric fleet to actually service the depot and get around Mel was talking about bikes about walkers we have a pretty compact CBD for actually getting around and doing deliveries you know there are ways and means that we can actually service the CBD from one point in this, you know, and get all the service actually done and, yeah, and this company is just to have a, has a long list of other play, places around major cities where they can actually um, implement these solutions. Um, you know, and we've, so we've got a world like this today where the trucks are just trying to get to the destination. They're going through congestion, both on the roads and on the curbside space, in order to reach the customer. Um, you know, we, we, we know there's solutions out there, as we just talked about, as we've put, done with the Courier Hub, of saying, well, take it to an intermediary point think about more space efficient options of actually getting through the, doing the last mile, doing the last meters through the heart of the city. Um, yeah, and so that's happening elsewhere in the world, as I said, we, you know, we're trying to do things like this in uh, Sydney as well. Um, gives the opportunity of actually doing that leg at a, at a non-congested time, and then doing these deliveries to actually meet the customer service requirements during the middle of the day. You've got guys doing, like, doing this type of thing, um, in uh, you know, in Pitt Street Mall, where the trucks coming in, and then the guys actually putting pushing a trolley around Pitt Street Mall, doing deliveries to the retailers. You've got guys who are working from the courier who are, who are dropping bulk off and then going around and then doing deliveries, stacking their bike up. Now you know that guy's replaced a van, and he's going to do the job probably twice as fast as a van in a loop around the CBD. So you know we consider that a bit of a win doing that type of thing out of the courier. Hub. Um, so look, there's a series of challenges. Um, clearly, we've got a market need. We've got a, we've got growth happening in the city. We're going to have supply issues going into the longer term future. Now's the time to be thinking about well, what do we do actually do um, to innovate and to innovate our, our way out of this challenge? Um, we've got uh, the pressure and conditions to do it. Um, I had another email today from a, from a, someone I've got to go and talk to in a a month or so's time from a different sector who re recognizes the challenges in this space, um, from the property sector that is. Um, so, you know, we're, we've got an idea of what the future can look like. Um, we, we know there's innovations out there that can assist us, 
there's equipment that can be brought together with those innovations to help do the job. Um, there's systems and there's capabilities that can also be brought together to do as well. So, and we want to build partnerships. We can't solve this ourselves. We don't own the logistics space. Yes, we do some management of the network and we work with the City of Sydney in order to do it and we, we, we pull the levers we can, but at the end of the day, um, there's the logistics operators out there who are, you know, who are coming in and doing these deliveries and we maintain a good relationship with them, but we can't actually, you know, they're commercial operators, they're thinking about, well, how do I earn revenue, how do I minimize my costs and get this job done? And they've got various ways they can do that, but you know, we have to encourage them to change and get a better outcome for the city. So that's my problems. I hope you've all got some brilliant solutions to give me good sleep at night and, uh, and help us solve these issues. Thank you. Excellent, Excellent. thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, for showing us why uh, innovation is so important and needed right now in uh, in the freight uh, urban space. Uh, we do actually have a question that was posed to us um, on Twitter from Twitter user Thanos. Uh, Thanos asks, if you could remove half the population, uh, would this help last mile freight congestion in the CBD? Uh, well, thanks for watching in the question, Thanos. It's great to be thinking outside the square there. Uh, but we'd probably prefer to explore other options first. But uh, any other questions, just keep them coming. Our very next speaker is Micah Starkus, Director of Open Data Innovation and Apps at Transport for New South Wales. Micah will take you through the innovation challenge process and bring to life what your application should cover and the steps beyond today's launch. Please welcome Micah Starkus. Thank you. So I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the tone changes now. I think we're moving to the practicalities of how to get um, um, some good submissions in. So I'll be covering three broad areas. Just uh, uh, for those who don't know the innovation um, challenge process, how we, how we tackle it. I'll talk through um, the criteria that we'll be using to, to make the right decision. It's certainly not guidance, but I hope to just bring, a lot, bring to life how to make a good submission by responding to the, the, the criteria, and then I'll be um, teasing out the key next steps you should be paying attention to. Um, now, early on, Chris talked about the, the, the future technology uh, roadmap. I won't go into detail there, but uh, again, if you're not familiar with the innovation challenge process and what innovation is at transport, but as a transport authority, we've, you know, we've got a role to deliver the right outcomes for the citizens of New South Wales. And we've got two broad ways of going about that. That's you know, investing and in, um, designing and building our own, our own kit, um, or finding the right partners to, to support so they're a success to deliver the right outcomes for customers. So what we're talking about now is an innovation challenge. We think this is uh, a, an industry move, so we're, we'll be looking at submissions as to how we make the right investment to make others a success. Um, and uh, Chris did talk about um, uh, the Open Data Hub and the Open Data Team, um, and yes, it has been successful, but it, uh, in, in winning, uh, winning through and becoming a partner with us, it's not about just providing you data, it's about giving you uh, access to resources and support from within the, the transport cluster. Um, sorry, it's photo time. Do I smile? <laughs> um, now, our, our broad process. Look, uh, uh, did an illustration on the on the on the screen here. But right now, we're out, and I don't know if we've said it, but uh, you, from today, you can actually make a submission for the innovation challenge. So for us, this phase is vitally important. It's get, making sure we get the right interest to get the good submissions in there. So we are looking for traditional industry players, but for us, and especially in the startup hub. hub up here, it's about getting some new thinking into this space as well. So we'll be we'll be uh, investing a bit of time with the local startup community just to see if anyone has anything in in this space. So that's that's us until uh, the 16th of of um, June. Just check me that when I get through to the time because I think I've just given myself a mental block. Um, and then we move into judging and selection, and that is. Um, how we go about uh, making the process uh, right internally to get the right submissions. And it's also about getting the right um, contracts and, and requests back of information so we've got the right agreements going forward. And then we move in earnest into support and incubation. And that is 
our partners with us. It's, it's co-design with a full delivery team in transport uh, supporting you, working on getting the products out into, out into, the, into the customer space. Now, uh, hopefully this won't be too dry, but what I'll be talking about now is five criteria that we need uh, specific information to help us make the, the right decisions. You'll be guided through this when you get onto the website uh, in, a, in a form, but if I'll, I'll just spend a bit of time, and it might be, do a bit of reading, it might be a bit dry, but hopefully this will bring to life uh, why we're asking these specific questions. So the first, the first uh, broad question you'll get is, uh, organisational and strategic alignment. Now really this is about you telling us about you or your organisation and what your uh, interests and alignment with our values and uh, addressing a freight, this uh, last mile freight problem. Um, look, and for some that's new to this space, uh, there, there might be challenges, but it's vitally important, but we need to see uh, how there is a demonstrated commitment for reducing congestion in the CBD. And if there's any sort of additional guidance I can give you here, this is about sustainability. We, we need partners, uh, you know, should with a bit of investment in seed funding from the government of New South Wales, we need a bit of, we need as much confidence as we can uh, take away that whatever is uh, put out to market is sustainable and it is aligned with your long-term corporate values or interests. Um, the second criteria you'll be you'll be needing to address, um, and it's probably the, the the main the main gain for us, the hardest one to articulate. We because this is one where um, over history we've seen a lot of submissions not be able to tell a story about what the product actually is and what out more importantly what outcomes are being delivered. So for for this uh, for this uh, challenge, uh, you need to show us. Um, uh, how the solution delivers an improved last mile freight customer experience and innovation. Um, now this really is about defining a product and the, the outcomes that are, that are delivered. So you need to be able to show us how it will improve efficiency and ach achieve a clear customer value proposition. Um, you know, this is a new space for, for these innovation challenges, so maybe, the, uh, maybe government is that the uh, beneficiary of the solutions there. So if you can't de define the actual outcomes for customers and there's an outcome for government, you need to be articulating that to us. And you need to give us a clear understanding of how your product fits within the broader market, um, how it's unique, innovative, or differentiated from other products. I'm not saying it needs to be, but you need to show us you've got a clear understanding of your product and how it fits in the broader um, freight um, and transport space. Now the third, the third important criteria you'll be need to address is the technology and resources are available and data sharing is enabled. Like in summary, this is, this is to give us confidence that the, any technology or solutions underpinning the, your submission are either developed um, or you give us the, the most supreme confidence that they are viable. We don't want vaporware in these submissions or concepts that can't be, can't be delivered. So the things you might be thinking about is uh, the resources and capability or technology are uh, delivered and proven somewhere. Um, maybe you could uh, articulate how uh, you will develop the technology and you have the resources available to do that. Um, and a big component, and I think we, we did cover this in our last information session, um, and it is a new and emerging space, but data sharing is going to be a vital component for us as a transport authority to be able to get the best benefits from a network perspective to deliver the right outcomes for customers. Um, so we'll be asking for an articulation about how uh, your perspectives on data sharing, what data can be shared, and what benefits that might be provided. With the, you know, maybe bonus points in there if you can articulate what, uh, what data sharing will, uh, how data sharing will benefit your solution and it becoming a greater success. Um, of course, the, the nice one. Um, we need time frames for how, and, and the milestones that you'll be working to, to deliver your solution should you be uh, successful. So yeah, start at the high level, give us a feasible approach for how you'll get from, uh, get from where we are today into an in-market uh, trial of your solution. And, it, what, and this is where the opportunity to start articulating what support from transport, outside financial support, but what role transport can, can play to, to make your solution um, a, a success. Um, 
uh, you know, we've got an appetite to contemplate. You know, th these are hard challenges as well. You know, regulatory sort of frameworks or or policy settings. I'm not saying we've got an answer or whether it's possible or not, but this is your opportunity that if things could change, um, what would they be so that you could become a success? Um, an indicative investment required. I think we've, we've made it clear through uh, these challenges. Um, we're, we're offering seed funding for uh, the, the partners that we take forward. Now, essentially, you know, uh, your product will be your product to, to own and operate into the future. So this seed funding is what investment may be needed to get your um, organisation or solution um, to a market-ready um, situation. But that's not the only financial um, um, uh, cost or cost that we will be contemplating. We also will be uh, assessing the total investment that transport needs to make to make your uh, product a, a success. Uh, and I think a bit that's important here is uh, we don't want to be a system integrator. We don't want to be a you know we don't want pieces of a solution because that that drives significant cost for us. We need a a complete and robust solution, which will lead to our industry um, uh, collaboration event. And I, look, yeah, there's any uh, any bits of goodness here. This is not a traditional um, vendor relationship. So, you know, the more significant the investment needed, the more um, it, um, um, time and assessment we also need uh, from transport's point of view to make make that come to a life. So they're the, the criteria. Now, um, I think this timeline is published on our website, and it's pretty consistent through all our innovation challenges. Uh, what's new, and it's a graphic that I actually put in there, and I'm quite proud to get the circles to match it, but those red circles uh, are for us are the, the next major milestones within, within our process. So on the 20th of May, we've got our industry co collaboration event, um, and then on the 16th of June, I'll talk about these in, in just a moment, and the 16th of June is when submissions close. Um, I'll talk about the, the, the submissions closed, just to reinforce it, 16th of uh, June, and I was right, wasn't I? I got that right at the beginning. Uh, 16th of June is when it closed. Now that's, that's quite a generous sort of time for us, but it is a time that we will be promoting this um, with vigour to get the right interest in, into this. Um, and from that, once, uh, that's when our um, decision making phase uh, kicks off. And through that phase, um, you know, there'll be short lists um, and invitations um, to pitch to a panel. Um, but all the information uh, will be contained and is contained on the website um, that, that Richard showed earlier. Now the industry collaboration event is a relatively new uh, uh, format. Um, we've used it with great success over the last 12 months. 12 months to me is new still. Um, now this is where it's your opportunity to engage with others um, to see if you can find the right partners to, to build out your solution. If you're lacking capability in particular areas, this is the right forum for you to um, participate in. Um, uh, I did put, carefully haven't put the date on this, but it's the 20th of May, so not too, not too, far, uh, not too far away. It's a pretty open format. Look, uh, our role is really only to uh, get the venue um, um, and, and manage the invitations. It is really for um, everyone else to, to participate in. So the format is obviously uh, you know, through the website, uh, get yourself registered if you are interested in attending. You'll also have the opportunity to pitch to the audience, should you wish, where that, that is your opportunity to stand up and talk about uh, your solution and what capabilities you might be looking for or you could purely use it as a networking opportunity for others that you know they're in the room also looking for the right partners to take forward. Can't stress it enough, if my um, sultry tones haven't bored you, you're able to go to the website and get all the information there. All the terms, conditions, access to the videos, uh, any material we've published. Um, but also, we will be re if we uh, get uh, fr uh, questions that would, might benefit the, the broader audience. That, this is where we'll be publishing additional information as it comes comes through from now until the 16th of, of June. And with that, I'll say thank you. I think we're going to move to sorry, this is your MC duties. I won't. Ooh. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Thank you.
Very good. Thanks, Michael. I really can, uh, can sense in the room here by just how intense the focus is of all the audience that there must be a plethora of innovation thought bubbles that have been produced here in the room right now, which is great. Uh, and so we can do the very best that we possibly can to, to foster those thought bubbles and, and help them grow as big as they possibly can. I'd like to uh, welcome back Mike and Mel for our panel Q&A. So uh, Mike and Mel and Micah, come on, come on down. The price is right. Now just a little microphone 101 uh, for everyone here today before we get started. Please hold the microphone very close to your mouth. Um, the people next to you might be able to hear you, but uh, those probably in the rest of the room and definitely those online uh, won't be able to, to hear you. So please just keep it nice and close. Uh, that also goes for our panel as well, because I know that's easy to forget that. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and our expert microphone passers uh, people uh, will assist in triaging your question. So uh, over to the uh, the audience. So if you'd like to, who's going to be first for uh, a first question? If we don't have any, it means that we get an early minute. No, it's okay. We're no early minute. So we have a we have a question down there. Yeah, hello, uh, Stuart Sontag from IMOS here. Thanks for that presentation. All those presentations. Uh, my question is, it's an obvious one, but do you have information on sort of the, the breakdown of the size of goods and what kind of goods are being delivered? on average by day and also where they're coming from so where the main sources um, are they coming from obviously hubs but where, where they're from here. Hi, um, look, uh, the main sources for goods uh, coming into the city are they're typically coming from Western Sydney um, a lot of goods have, uh, also just coming from the airports there's a uh, phenomenal amount of freight coming in internationally on a daily basis our couriers have just been coming up from Alexandria uh, and Botany area and uh, delivering to the city but yeah. the, the majority of uh, big warehouses are way out in, in, in the west 50 60 kilometers away um, the size of goods just every size and shape you know you can imagine to be honest um, I don't have that detail. You know, one of the things um, I was talking about earlier is, um, you know, this is a commercial, this is a commercial space out there, and you know, we respect the fact that uh, those logistics businesses are uh, operating commercially, and, you know, and they protect their, uh, they protect their information about what they actually are delivering and uh, who they're delivering it to. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, there's a majority of stuff coming in is relatively small in size and weight. Um, I wouldn't suggest trying to get into the bigger space um, unless you've got some innovative way of getting um, 40 tons of steel delivered into, into the city. Um, I'd probably suggest you focus on the smaller space that's being carried by courier vans. Unless you want to create a really cool exoskeleton, that would be great. Hi, um, my name's Bernard. I'm working upstairs in a complex startup. It's already using your data, and this sort of complements what we're doing. I've got ideas, but you haven't mentioned them, so before I get involved, I'd just like to know if you are open to these ideas. So, the first thing is that I would like to utilize the light rail where every station is a pick up and you drop off and you section off an apartment or one of the carriages or a whole carriage and dedicate that to freight. Is that an idea that you'd like to pursue? Well, uh, first of all, we're probably going to have... Um, I know we got a big note by our, our exec in, uh, in uh, late 20, 2014 when I suggested you know, these opportunities. But look, uh, so, I mean, you know, you're talking about commodality, you're talking about the ability of putting freight on passenger network. Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, so I, I'm not at liberty to announce the date of when the light rail's commencing. I think it's, <laughs> it, it's, Does it's probably... Hang on, I'm getting lost here, is that... I well, the light rail, I, I, there's a light rail coming in in the, in the west, you, you're correct. Um, look, I, Maybe you can think more broadly about how that could be applied. There are several different passenger transport networks. Don't give up on the idea. It could be light rail, it could be train, it could be buses, it could be metro. Exactly, exactly. Can I, can I make a suggestion? This is about, 
implementation. So no, no idea is a bad idea, um, but it's got to be more than a concept. So if there was a path for how it would work and how the, that, that service would be enabled, um, potentially it's something that could be looked at. But I think there are, there are broader policy settings we'd have to look at. So um, I shouldn't go ahead with that? No, no, I think no, no idea. Yeah. We've got the engineering talent, uh, the software engineering talent. It's just the not a larger picture of using the of using the light rail. So well, I'd say it sounds interesting. So okay, so I'm I'm also working with um, a company that does autonomous trains. Is that an idea? Autonomous. Is that a concept? Autonomous trains. Or is that too so, far fetched? Well, actually, just a bit of background. Uh, what we we first looked. When we commenced this work with the Innovation Hub back in July last year, the first thing we looked at was drones coming into the CBD. Sure. Uh, quite frankly, the moment, it's a bit of a fizzer. Um, from yeah. several perspectives, from a regulatory perspective, sure. and until and, and other technologies there, because I saw it at the Winter Olympics. Yeah. So you know, until you can actually, at, at the moment, it's one drone, line of sight. Uh, deliver to a destination from a control perspective. Until you can release a swarm of hundreds of drones, yep. that's going to actually replace that one van. And, and clearly, we're not talking about lying on the site anymore. No. It's not going to happen in the CBD. Okay. So, so maybe a uh, light rail with tow balls and trailers might be uh, might be an option. Well, no, the light rail could really work. You could have the loading zones at each station, and you'd have lockers at each station. Every station would be a, a pick up and drop off. And then the main bolt loading for daily deliveries could be at the endpoints at Central or Dulwich Hill or Kingsford in, in Kensington. And then, you know, so, so you've got the light rail, so you have the app called TripView, which all the schedules of all the, all, the, all the trains. You know, I could collaborate with some other smart guys and we could build the integration between the retailers and the couriers and using the TripView data for all the scheduling. So all the retailers would know which products are on which trains and which stations can you pick up and drop off, these sorts of things. And you can build a, a complex pricing model to find on demand. And Sounds like your idea is very well thought through. Well, um, so like Mike has said, um, we don't believe any idea is a bad idea. Feel free to submit it. Um, at later stages of um, the process, we do look at feasibility and we actually have those conversations within internal stakeholders and subject matter experts. So whether that be we actually go and speak to the people who have um, constructed the light rail, um, we can have all those conversations later down the track. Um, feel free to submit that idea if you wish. Okay, cool. cool idea. Next question. Mine was along the same lines with light rail coming in. Did you have this idea before you said it? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it was about the light rail changing the dynamics of the CBD in a sense that there may possibly be more um, uh, loading zones as a result. You know, and, and so any solution we come up with have to take that into account. The second question I have, I've been looking at your uh, traffic cameras, you simply don't have enough. Are you planning to put more traffic cameras in the CBD so we can use, you know, analytics such as visual analytics? They're spread throughout the, the entire New South Wales state. And some are like at Perisher Valley and uh, Wollongong and so, so, so on. Is the plan to increase the number so to make that more I don't know if you would have that answer on this panel or even what the percentage of um, uh, access is. So can we take that as a question on notice? Yeah, at the moment there's not that many in the CBD itself. And just nice and close to the microphone. Sorry, it's okay. Okay, question? Good question? Would it make it easier for Terence to have this microphone? Oh no, he's rather bad. Just um, please do not um, swallow the microphone, it's, it's rather small, so Tracy has some. Hi there, uh, Karen Fitzall from Abbey Park here. Um, can I just ask, um, what level of engagement is there, is there from the councils um, for this um, particular concept? Um, and is the area already defined as the City of Sydney, or is there an opportunity to look at other councils within uh, New South Wales? Um, well, there's someone from City of Sydney in the room heckling a bit in the, in the course of this meeting as well. So, uh, look, at, we'll work with City of Sydney and, uh, you know, and they're, we're working together on trade issues. Um, by all means, you know, think about it from, from the broader uh, 
application to other cities. Uh, I've got to say, you know, just as I said, just been out in Parramatta this morning. It's a very different landscape there. It's certainly not as challenging and congested a, a, uh, as it is. And, you know, and so there's some subtle differences going on. There's plenty of parking in the heart of Parramatta, or even if you go across to North Sydney. Um, it's, uh, so you actually see the delivery drivers and the, and the tradies you know, using parking spaces as well as actually using loading zones. Um, I would suggest, so this, I'd say Sydney CBD is a more mature model where ultimately you could say, well, those other cities are going to more head towards. I'd say it's focused more on, on this more mature environment of Sydney CBD. Um, and even think about the fact that you know, the future of that should be in less loading zones. Um, because you know, cities are, just all cities around the world are thinking about place making. Um, and they're not visualizing, they're, they're visualizing a world with less cars and less road space. Um, so I'd, I'd think about more along those lines. Uh, that's what the future looks like apparently. But there is an appetite with the right solution though. Just with some of the questions, just that there are some challenges, like, it, like even the light rail example, I'll just give you a high. It's not as simple to say just commit more space on light rail to, um, to, to, to freight, you know, because there's already constraints. We are talking in a very congested city, so prioritization, reprioritization of things is not, not necessarily a, a, the right outcome. It's a good concept. How to do it and how to get that right buy in from maybe councils or how to prioritise you know, the capacity on the light rail network. That, that's where the innovation lies, because this is, you know, we're having an innovation challenge now, but this is a space that we're all been, all been in, transport's been in for, forever, so there's some inherent problems that we need the innovation to be able to address. Chris, yeah. 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 Uh, a bit of a side Supplementary comment, if you like. So, Peter Warrington from the City of Sydney endorsed everything that Mike said there about that long term strategy, uh, uh, working in partnership. Probably just say in this space, if you're considering using the the ticket asset and the, you know some any technology that's around the use of the ticket parking space, to probably don't have a chance. Someone from the city, that's not me, that's probably our parking ops people, and I don't know how what the formal sense of engagement might be of the city getting involved in the review of anything that hits our business model. But in terms of the strategy frame that Mike puts out there, I'd support that and you know, I'm happy to say we had a workshop as recently as Monday to talk about some long-term plans that we can work on together. Good. Uh, any more questions? Yes, to the front here. Is the challenge open for people who have actually uh, given vehicles? Like, I notice on the talks, uh, you go from a, um, a bicycle career up to a van, and there's plenty of um, options in between it, like cargo bikes that carry 100, 150 kilos. Is, is the challenge open to that for people? I mean, that space myself, I develop cargo bikes, and uh, or is it just digital products you're, you're interested in? Yeah. No, so it's certainly not just digital products, um, um, but we want a robust offering. Uh, so it's hard, like a, 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 new, a new vehicle is probably not a complete solution. New type, you know, new class of vehicle is probably not a complete solution. How that works into a broader sort of operational model, like that's probably moving in, in the right direction if that, if that helps. Yeah. Look, um, like I, I think the, um, the industry collaboration event there um, is a you know, good opportunity for you to bring, not literally bring the product physically with you on the day, but you know to talk about people saying, oh, how do we adopt that into um, to bring that those that innovation and uh, you know, reduce that congestion coming into the CBD. Yeah, just one more question, just to get to the heart of the matter. Being to start it with financially constrained, 
really financially constrained. Yeah, you've got a government authority, we're financially constrained as well. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> Can I ask, and are you able to sort of advise what sort of funding you can provide startups? Um, we, we we leave these guidance up to the up to the submissions and the benefits that it delivers. So um, it depend, It really depends on the submission. Like and like, uh, you could imagine the greater the request, the more scrutiny and due diligence we we have to perform. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Steve from Drive Yellow. Um, I've got a question around, you mentioned some of the issues that you were dealing with uh, that cause problems in the city and parking, etc. Is there is there a number one problem? Is it the overstay hour? Is it the uh, uh, once misuse of, of spaces, you know, etc, etc. Is there a, a number one problem? Um. <laughs> it's kind of to split the rap to be quite yeah, honest. Yeah. Um, look, uh, you know, if we were to wipe out over steam, and uh, you know, I know we would suddenly generate 20, 25 percent more capacity. Um, so, so take out half the population. Well, that, <laughs> do that. No, just um, whether we're actually ever going to be successful in doing that, like uh, putting a ranger on every street block to fully enforce. What's actually happening? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure, sure whether that's what the city's vision is. Um, um, you know, there's there's we're, the reason we we can actually build light rail on George Street is because the city, since you know, for the last 25 years, has had a vision of moving all the freight off that street. So it's you know, they've, there was literally very little loadings on space that more at the southern end of George Street. So, you know, we can build light rail now because of the work that the city's done for 25 years of building loadings, loading docks coming ideally off the back streets to, to get into there. Um, look, you know, there's just that demands of actually trying to get freight moved off the street. We're not going to actually achieve that in the, in the, the, the near term, <coughs> but it's just a, a, you know, a challenge, constant challenge we, we've got. <coughs> to say if, and Barangaroo proves it kind of can be done with building good infrastructure. So it's, it's moving that freight. You know, if, and that's kind of what, what we've got to head towards anyway. Um, you know, we've got to think about, well, how, how's George Street going to function? There's no traffic on George Street. You're going to have to park on the side streets and bring it in. Um, you know, so we're going to just see more and more of that in the future. Um, you know, Moving the, moving the freight off the street now, you know, there's a bit of regulatory thing on that anyway. If I could park in your neighbor's loading dock and deliver along the street, that would be great. So, but that's a kind of bit of a property play going on there. Um, there's some things, you know, there's some levers that we can pull as well from that park and levy perspective. Um, but it would be great if, you know, if you could park over here and then just sort of go along the street and do all these deliveries. And mate, this is more of a conversation, but this is a layperson in this space, so especially with the accelerator research. Just a reflection, customer, customer expectation of an immediate, uh, or, I can't remember the terms of it. Immediacy, yeah. That, like, cu customers want their delivery, like, today. There was a funny, there was a funny stream yeah. about the shoes needing to be delivered today. But, yeah, that's the nub of it. Everything else is around how the, how the, uh, how the freight machine responds to that. Any uh, any final questions? Yes, I'll take one last one. Hi everybody, so I have a question. Uh, this is the first time I'm here, so sorry for, for this question, but I'm interested in why is actually the city of Sydney interested in solving this problem? Shouldn't this, be, shouldn't this problem be solved by, by private entities? I mean, and, and uh, you know, following that, my question is, if you would, if there would, if you wouldn't have this peak between nine, nine and eleven, then do you have any estimation how much, how much would this influence um, congestion, or how much in the end all the entities would save? Because 
from my perspective, I think this is the most important uh, thing to discuss. <coughs> Thank you. So if we took, uh, so yeah, I had a graph up earlier of what the demand was and what the lo actual loading zone capacity was. So I could simply say, yeah, we've got enough loading capacity to satisfy demand. If we take that peak and spread it, we can, we can accommodate all of that demand within the capacity. Back to the immediacy thing, you know, and back to that peak. If customers would only stop demanding stuff at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're prepared to take a delivery at 7 o'clock at night, or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, yeah, we could fit it all in. We've just got to actually change the Amazons of the world and the Iconics and all this you know, customer, you know, this, um, this instant gratification. Now, could, can we actually change that? Um, probably not. So, you know, so we've just got to accept that the world's going in that direction and that people are going to be offering two or three hour service. Yes, we, don't comp we, don't, we can't control that instant gratification. We can't control how people are actually, it's a commercial space and we fully recognize that. And we're, you know, we don't, we could just come out with policies that ban trucks. Um, you know, but we've, we've successfully worked for four and a half years without coming up with policies. That's the stick. You know, we're trying to, even today, we're trying to think of what the, what the carriage approach is, how do we work with industry, how do we work with the players who can make a difference to offer you know, offer some carrots to encourage innovation? I think there's a key thing here. Like, yeah, and we're in an era where uh, regulation's our action of last resort, but there is no alternative at the moment for customers or freight users to... So it's all, all well and good to say we need to move people away from the current way of doing business, but there is no viable alternative for them to turn to. This is where we expect the innovation to be. So we're having the innovation challenge. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the questions that were contributed today, and, and thank you very much, uh, panel, for sharing your expert knowledge. We're going to have a big round of applause for our panel speakers today. Before we conclude the launch of our Last Mile Freight Innovation Challenge, don't forget to register for the industry collaboration event uh, on the 20th of May if that's something that interests you. If you're considering working with one or more other parties. Uh, for your submission and also uh, please follow us on Twitter at uh, data tfnsw and thank you very much uh, for everyone for joining us today um, in person and online we look forward to seeing some really fantastic applications uh, coming our way soon thank you very much thank you.